Chapter Fifteen of Bob's A Girl Detective. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bob's A Girl Detective by Grace May North. Chapter Fifteen The Detective Detected. One Monday at high noon the pretty Miss Selinsky was married in the Hungarian church, and her four new friends were among the many foreign women who came to wish her kindly neighbor much happiness in her new life. Gloria had been pleased with the earnest face of the man who had won the love of little Miss Selinsky, and when the smiling pair rode away on an automobile delivery truck, which was their very own, the Vandergriff's girls with Nell Wiggin, stood on a crowded street corner and waved and nodded, promising that very soon they would visit the little home with a yard around it that was out near the woodsy Bronx Park. Bob's at the last moment had tied an old shoe to the back of the truck with a white ribbon, and there it hung dangling and bobbing in a manner most festive, while through a small hole in the sole of it a stream of rice trickled. But in the thronging, surging masses of East Side humanity, this little drama was scarcely noticed. When Mr. and Mrs. Chaniska had disappeared up Third Avenue, Gloria turned to smile at little Nell Wiggin. Now let us make haste to get your new apartment in order that you may wire your brother to come at once. That is, if a wire will reach him. Yes, indeed it will, and he is eagerly awaiting it, Nell happily replied. Since our foster father's death, my brother has been living in town with the missionary of whom I told you, the one who used to visit the remote farms and who brought my brother years ago his first book of poetry. They have been close friends ever since. But when the girls reached the little apartment, they found that there was nothing to be done. It was in perfect order, and the thoughtful bride had even left part of her wedding flowers that they might be there to welcome the new agent of the model tenements. There seems to be nothing to do here, beamingly Miss Wiggin said. Perhaps I would better go at once to my room and pack. I will go with you and help, Bobs told her. Then both of you come to Pensinger Mansion for lunch, Lena May suggested. What did you do about notifying Mr. Queerwitz? Bobs inquired an hour later as the two girls started down Fourth Avenue toward the basement home of Nell Wiggin. Nothing as yet. That is, I merely telephoned that I would not be there today. I suppose I will have to give two weeks' notice. Let us go there at once, and I will do so. When the two girls entered the Queerwitz antique shop, Miss Periwinkle seemed to be much excited because of their arrival, and hastening to the rear door, which was labeled no admittance. She gave three sharp raps and then hurried back and took up her post near the front door, as though to prevent escape in that direction. Bobs looked all around, wondering if there was a customer in the store who was being watched, but she and Nell seemed to be the only other occupants of the place. To add to the mysteriousness, Miss Harriet Dingley, upon receiving a nod from the head lady, walked to the entrance of the cloakroom, deliberately turned the key, and put it in her pocket. Bob's always on the alert, noted all this, and marveled at it. Surely Nell Wiggin had done nothing to arouse the suspicion of Mr. Queerwitz. Then suddenly a very possible solution of the mystery flashed into Roberta's consciousness. Undoubtedly, Mr. Queerwitz suspected that the late Miss Doolittle had something to do with the disappearance, reappearance, and subsequent sale of the rare old book. She well knew how enraged the grasping shopkeeper would be if he learned that he had received only half as much for the second volume as had been paid by Mr. Van Loon for the first, and if that gentleman had described the girl who had sold the book to him. Bobs actually smiled as she thought, I guess I'm trapped all right. A fine detective I would make when I never even thought to wear a disguise. Well, the game's up. She knew that she ought to feel troubled when she saw Mr. Queerwitz emerge from his secret sanctuary and approach her looking about as friendly as a thundercloud. 
But instead, that irrepressible girl felt amused as though she were embarking upon another interesting adventure, and she actually smiled to greet him. Bob's was depending upon her natural quick-wittedness to save her from whatever avalanche of wrath was about to descend upon her. She had glanced beyond the man, then suddenly she stared as though amazed at what she saw back of him. The shopkeeper, noting this, turned and observed that in his haste he had neglected to latch the door labeled no admittance, and that a draft of air had opened it. Beyond plainly were seen several workmen engaged in making antique furniture. Mr. Queerwitz looked sharply at the girl trying to learn, if possible, how much of his secret had been revealed to her. His anger increased when he saw that her eyes were laughing. What puzzles me, she was saying innocently, is how you can make things look worm-eaten as well as time-worn. Whatever accusations might have been on the lips of Mr. Queerwitz when he approached Roberta, they were never uttered. Instead, he turned and walked rapidly back to the workshop and closed the door, none too quietly, but in a manner that seemed to convince Miss Periwinkle that she and Miss Dingley need no longer guard the entrances. How Bobs wanted to laugh, but instead she walked over to Nell Wigan, who had been collecting the few things that she had at the shop. Have you given notice? Roberta inquired. I wrote a note and asked Miss Periwinkle to give it to Mr. Queerwitz. Come, let us go. Half an hour later, Nell Wigan was packing her few garments in a suitcase while Roberta tied up the precious books. Two hours later, the new agent of the model tenements was established in the sunny apartment, and her row of red-bound books stood on one shelf of the built-in bookcase. Now I will wire my brother Dean that he may come as soon as he wishes, and oh, how I do hope that will be soon, Nell said as she happily surveyed the pleasantest place that she had ever called home. The message was sent when they were on their way to the Pensinger mansion for lunch. I must not remain long, the new agent told Gloria, for I promised Mrs. Doran Ashley that I would be on duty at one. Every little while during that noon meal, Bobs would look up with laughing eyes. At last she told the cause of her mirth. I am wondering what Mr. James Jewett thinks of his assistant detective, she remarked. I am so glad that I gave the name of Miss Doolittle. Now I can retire from the profession without being traced. Oh, good, here comes the postman, Lena May declared as she rose and went to the side door to meet the mail carrier. Gloria looked up eagerly. She was always hoping that Gwendolyn would write. The letters that she had sent to the Newport home of the schoolmate whom Gwendolyn had said she was going to visit had been returned, marked, whereabouts, not known. There were two letters, and both were for Bob's. One was a bulging missive from her Long Island friend Dick Delaney, but it was at the other that the girl stared as though in incomprehensing amazement. The cause of her very evident astonishment was the printed return address in the upper left-hand corner. It was 4th Avenue Branch, Burns Detective Agency. Then she glanced, still puzzled, at her own name, which was printed, not typed. Miss Roberta Vandergrift, she read aloud. Then suddenly she laughed, and looking up at the other girls who, all interest, were awaiting an explanation of her queer conduct, she exclaimed, The amateur detective has been detected. But how, under the shining heavens, did Mr. James Jewett know that my name wasn't Miss Doolittle? Gloria smiled. You haven't much faith, it would seem, in his ability as a detective. What has he written, Bobs? There were a few words in the message. Miss Vandergriff, please report at this office at once, as we have need of your services. Signed, J.G. Jewett. Well, I'll be flabbergasted, Roberta ejaculated. But I must confess I am curious, and so I will immediately, if not sooner, hie me down that way. Wait a jiff, Miss Wigan. I'll walk along with you. When Roberta and Nell were gone, Gloria found the bulging letter from Bob's oldest friend, 
Dick Delaney lying on the table unopened. The girl who was so loved by that faithful lad had quite forgotten it in her new interests. Gloria sighed. Poor Dick, she said to Lena May as she placed the letter on a mantel. I wish he did not care so much for Roberta, for I fear that she does not really care for him. True it was that at that particular moment Bobs was far more interested in learning what Mr. Jewett had to tell her than in any message that a letter from Dick might contain. End of chapter 15 Recording by Sharon Kilmer Rio Medina, Texas